and Land Management for Species Recovery on Farmland. My name is Richard Winspear and I'm the Agricultural Advice Manager for the RSPB. Uh, I have a team who uh, manage Hope Farm, the RSPB's arable farm in Cambridgeshire, the Farm Wildlife Partnership, which I'll talk about in a moment, the uh, a project uh, getting volunteers to survey wildlife on farmland and advice for fair to nature, the food standard that restores biodiversity on farmland. First of all, a couple of housekeeping points. If you have any technical uh, difficulties, uh, please click on the orange icon in the top bar and describe your issue and a member of this support team will be able to help you. You cannot turn your camera or microphone on when watching the um, talks. However, we encourage you to use the discussion forum on the right to chat to each other and give us feedback on the talks. Um, we will hold a question and answer session with the speakers at the end of the session. Please send your questions throughout the session by clicking on the Q&A box on the right and we will read from those questions at the end. So we've got five speakers in the next hour or so talking about limestone grassland and arable habitats and habitats for bats with education resources, reintroductions and bare ground creation all thrown in. I'm going to start with a little bit of context with a project that's been going on behind the scenes with all of the partners to develop a clear and consistent model for biodiversity recovery on farmland. So the Farm Wildlife Partnership includes all of the Back from the Brink partners with the addition of the Wildlife Trust, Freshwater Habitats Trust and the Nature Friendly Farming Network. And basically we consulted each other on, on, on creating this model, but in the course of doing so, we've also engaged with a lot of agricultural stakeholders, um, especially all of those who are partners of the Campaign for the Farmed Environment and the Voluntary Initiative, such that what we've come up with is both uh, evidence-based and ecologically sound, but also is very practical and, and deliverable on farmland. And we've generated six key actions for restoring biodiversity on farmland, all of them evidence-based. Um, and these are illustrated on this slide. We are enhancing existing wildlife habitats, maximizing the value of the field boundaries and margins, which act as the corridors connecting habitats and, and allowing movement around the farm, creating and restoring uh, wet features, flower-rich habitats and seed-rich habitats. And finally, in-field management to support wildlife. And this is basically a, a lot of the sort of background behind sustainable farming. So it's about soil management, uh, nutrient management, pesticide management, including endecticides and livestock systems and, and water. Now, the Back from the Brink project, quite rightly, is focused very much on priority species which are facing extinction in the UK. But all of the needs of these species can be tailored to, um, to fit into these six key actions. And basically, um, the process of, of, of looking at the priority species for a landscape and tailoring the six key actions around those means that not only these priority species, which act as kind of flagships for a landscape, they also act as indicators of, of the unique niche that the, uh, the landscape plays in biodiversity conservation as a whole. So by looking after these species, we can look after um, uh, the right, the appropriate range of wildlife that is typical of that landscape. But it would be a missed opportunity to focus purely on the uh, priority species needs. So using this holistic model and tailoring it to the species um, is, is key. And just to give an example of that, we've been working for 30 years in South Devon on the Silbunting and within that landscape, there are also rare arable plants, um, a couple of rare bats, greater horseshoe bat and uh, grey long-eared bat, and a few rare invertebrates associated with the species rich grassland. And so to encompass the needs of these species within that landscape, we need to focus on getting the grazing right in the species rich grassland to look after the flora, but also being very mindful of the stock health um, such that the dung invertebrates and the, 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 the livestock that we feed on those are not compromised by uh, the use of the endecticides. 
And for seal buntings, we very much focus on extensive spring cereals, which are also very important for rare arable plants. And so we're looking at integrated weed management to ensure that we, um, we get good crops, but we also look after the habitat that is important to the plants. And finally, uh, the field boundaries uh, need to provide that connectivity for bats between nesting and roosting sites and, and foraging areas, as well as providing the dense cover for the seal buntings to nest. So in all of that, we've tailored six of the, uh, sorry, five of the six key actions to these species, and that will also hopefully uh, generate a lot of uh, synergy with the wider biodiversity of the landscape as well. And that kind of exercise plays out across um, any farm landscape you find in the UK. So if you've got uh, key in amphibians in, in, in a landscape, then the network of connected wet features needs to also consider the sort of hibernation habitats. Uh, if your priority farmland birds are buntings, then um, cereal grains are a key component of the seed rich habitats. And if you've got, if you're within a, an important arable plant area, then cultivated margins are likely to be more appropriate than uh, sown flower mixtures to generate the, the flower rich habitats. Scrub is an important habitat in, in, in all landscapes, but it can be harmful to some species on uh, seminatural grasslands. So as a general rule, it's getting the right management in the right place and managed at the right scale. If you need any more information on any of this, then there is the Farm Wildlife website, farmwildlife.info, for information about that farm wildlife model. And for any of that in-field um, management, um, then agricology.co.uk is where you'll find a lot of information and case studies on, on good sustainable farming management. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who is Jennifer Gilbert from Butterfly Conservation. She's the Community Engagement Officer for the Limestones Living Legacies Project as part of Back from the Brink in the Cotswolds. And I'll hand over now to Jennifer to do her talk. Thank you. Great, thanks. Okay, I think I'm back. Um, yes, I'm going to talk to you a bit today about uh, some of the land management uh, interventions that we've done on our particular Back from the Brink project here in the Cotswolds. Um, so I'll just give you a little um, background to where we are and what we've been doing. Uh, so our project is the Limestones Living Legacies project, and we're based uh, in the Cotswolds, circled there. And we've been focusing on the unimproved limestone grassland uh, that we have here. Um, and really that's been because the, this particular type of habitat used to cover about 40% of that total Cotswolds area there in blue uh, back in the 1930s. Unfortunately today that is that now stands at less than 1.5% and of course I'm sure you can appreciate that with that um, uh, big decline in habitat we've also um, seen the decline in the associated species so we now have a number of rare and threatened species in this particular area. But it's worth pointing out that that 1.5% um, <clears throat> actually represents over 50% of the UK's total stock of this particular type of limestone grassland. <clears throat> so that makes the Cotswolds are really, really important um, area, not just um, for this type of habitat, but the um, species that uh, rely on it. Um, so that's why uh, our project has been based here. And our project has sort of had the, these, these four aims, and I'm going to talk uh, around the, the first two, which have been uh, about managing, restoring a network of these limestone grass and sites in order to make sure that these associated species can actually recover and persist into the future. And I, I want to point out at the beginning that this all this work that I'm going to be talking about today was actually uh, brought about by um, my previous colleague on the project, Julian Bendel, who, who left the project recently. Um, but he, he sort of uh, initiated a lot of this work. So just to give you a quick overview of the species we've been working on, um, we're obviously one of the integrated Back from the Brink projects working cross taxa. Um, so we've been working on um, several butterflies, like the large blue. Um, there's been a couple of uh, target bat species, several plant species like passflower, um, a couple of uh, rare bumblebee species, 
a um, couple of beetles. Um, that's the rock rose pot beetle there and also the adder. So we've been working on a wide variety of different species, all of which in one way or another rely on this type of uh, limestone grassland. And as Richard sort of mentioned there, obviously with um, these grasslands, we need to keep them in good condition um, to make sure that these species can thrive into the future. So uh, getting the grazing right is obviously um, a vital component of looking after these habitats. So um, a good uh, example of, of the work we've been doing in terms of grazing management is to look at a site um, that we work very closely with called Robra Common, which is um, just south of Stroud. It's a very large site um, owned by the National Trust. And uh, as you can see, it's um, got a lot of these very steep slopes and actually um, a number of our, our remaining limestone grasslands are actually found on these on these steep slopes, really because they've been unable to be developed on or improved for agriculture. So they've obviously remained intact. So a number of our best sites uh, do look um, a lot like this. But this site is um, a site where there, is, there, there are commoners' rights and um, the commoners turn out cattle onto the site every, every spring and they are uh, free ranging cattle, um, which is great. But unfortunately, over the years, there's been a decline in the number of, of, of cattle being turned out and they're not going down these slopes. They haven't needed to. So they're staying on, on the top, on the plateau. So there's been a sort of gradual um, sort of declining grazing on, on these slopes and, and uh, uh, working with National Trust, we've been looking to, to help um, get the grazing back onto these slopes to sort of restore them for the species that live there. And uh, the map on the right um, shows the whole of, of the common there. Um, and uh, it's already a really good site for the Duke of Burgundy butterfly. Um, that prefers um, the, the sort of the north, the western facing slopes. It's actually got a number of different aspects, this site, um, anything from sort of northwest all the way around sort of south, southeast facing. Um, so the Dukes like the more westerly facing slopes. We've got past flowers on the south, on south facing slopes. And we had earmarked this site as a potential for a large blue reint reintroduction. So working with National Trust um, uh, at the commoners, um, our contractors who do the large blue reintroductions, um, we worked out uh, a, a way of splitting up this site into um, specific grazing compartments for the different species. So in red, the sort of more westerly facing slopes for the Duke and, and the blue areas um, potential for uh, the large blue reintroduction and to help the Pasqua recover as well. And uh, with our budget, we were able to actually purchase um, some electric fencing and also uh, employ a contractor uh, who would actually um, put up the fencing um, around the common and move it as needed. So along with that map of the compartments, um, we meet every year to determine which paddocks will be grazed and, and for how long. So Duke paddocks don't necessarily need to be grazed every year, whereas the large blue paddocks uh, more often are grazed year on year. And as you can see, um, obviously penning them in in that way means that we can target the grazing exactly where it's needed and um, for as long as it's needed as well. And so we're aiming um, to get these slopes into the right condition that these particular species need. So this is a, a picture of, of sort of ideal duke habitat. Um, this is also this is at Robber Common. Um, it looks like it's quite scrubbing over, but this is actually what um, Duke of Burgundy needs. Slightly longer sward. It keeps their cowslips, the food plant for the caterpillar, nice and um, sort of succulent. Um, it's also dotted with little low lying scrub, which is what the, the males will, will, will sit on and, and um, look uh, for females from and, and display from. So this is ideal uh, Duke habitat and so doesn't need to be grazed um, hard and every year. Whereas for the large blue, um, it needs to be uh, much shorter. These are the, the south facing slopes. Um, and also uh, for pasque flower, uh, what we were aiming to do was to um, open up the sward a bit more to create a bit more of the, the sort of the bare ground. You can see sort of little um, areas there uh, where the cattle are moving through and the action of their hooves is sort of breaking up the sward and opening that up. Um, as the pasque flower seed really needs to um, uh, land on bare soil in order to, to germinate. Um, and 
as you can see, you know, after a year or two of, of a restoration graze, um, you can get that floristic diversity back very, very quickly. So that was um, what we needed to do in order to see if we could uh, do a large blue reintroduction to the site. Um, so this was one of our aims of the project from the beginning to reintroduce the large blue to at least one site in the Cotswolds, one additional site. Um, and once we determined that the habitat was looking good, the food plants were, were, were there, and our contractors from Habitat Designs um, checked as well that the particular red ant species that the large blue needs was also uh, there, um, we could go ahead with a reintroduction. So they went about collecting eggs from uh, the Gloucestershire um, and Somerset populations, and then they reared on the larvae. Um, this so it makes it sound very uh, easy, but it's a very tricky and um, involved uh, process, which takes a bit of time. Uh, once the caterpillar has gone through several skin changes, it eventually drops off the food plant and then must be released into um, the site within 24 hours. Um, it needs to get into the ant's nest and start feeding on ant grubs. And this was done in 2019. Um, when we uh, started looking for the adults in 2020, uh, we found it had been really successful. Lots of adults were, were seen flying in 2020, which was fantastic. And uh, um, a number of our volunteers have uh, been revisiting this year and um, the adults are flying again. So it seems that um, the adults born last year from the reintroduction have bred and it's looking um, like it might uh, continue uh, quite well there. So, we, But we will be obviously keeping an eye on it. So uh, that's sort of the grazing and then the reintroduction. Um, but we've also been looking to create um, bare ground habitat as well uh, for some of our other plant species. So one of those is juniper. And that's um, really declined over the years due to a lack of grass and management. So the juniper seed needs to land on bare ground in order to germinate. And obviously when you um, have a lack of grazing or that the management um, declines, then you just get the sort of the grasses growing, the any bare ground um, gets covered and the berries will just drop into thick thatch. So obviously it won't, won't germinate. So Julian worked um, at it has worked at a couple of sites um, to actually create some scrapes. At the top there, that uh, was him working with a local volunteer group, um, creating a scrape underneath a, a mature juniper bush at a place called Juniper Hill. And then at the bottom, uh, employing a contractor to create a much larger scrape um, at Robra Common uh, that the place was just talking about. And um, it's really heartening to see that this scrape in the top right that was created in 2018, I actually revisited with volunteers uh, to do a, a survey of the juniper in 2019. And um, when we had a look at that scrape, we found that it already had 28 new seedlings in it uh, a year later. So um, really, really good to see um, what can actually happen and how quick it can happen if we just um, open up that, um, that bare ground to allow the, the seed to germinate. And we've also tried to do similar with, um, uh, for another of our target plant species, which is Cotswold pennycress. Um, this is much more restricted to the northern part of the Cotswolds, um, very much grows in bare soils, and it's often associated with quarries. Um, a lot of those are up in the, the northern part of the Cotswolds and they, they, um, the remaining sites are often uh, on these uh, either old quarry faces or uh, old um, quarry areas. And with Plant Life, uh, one of our partners, we uh, did a lot of survey work at the, uh, um, the known sites to just see how the plant was doing and also to work out what interventions might be needed to actually help this plant spread. And we determined that um, at this, this site at the top there, um, there used to be a number of old pits, um, which were obviously grown over, and that it would be a good idea to actually re-excavate some of these pits um, to try and provide that bare ground for the, uh, for the pennycrest to, um, to colonize. And at the, a neighboring site where you can see this um, old quarry face, uh, this is where some Cotswold pennycrest was growing, but it had become really, really scrubbed over. So the scrub was right up to that, uh, that face. So the idea was to, to do some 
pit re-excavation and also some scrub removal from this other site. And um, we revisited um, again with Plant Life in uh, April this year uh, to actually have a look at, at how, um, how things were going with these um, interventions. And you can sort of see along the top there how the, uh, the scrape looked um, just after it was done and then when we revisited in April. And uh, you can see the red flags there are showing where we had actually found um, Cotswold Pennycrest plants. Um, so we, 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 there was a number of these um, pits done and generally it's looking really, really positive. Um, you can see that Cotswold Pennycrest is starting to colonize these areas um, and it's still only a year or so um, into these being done. So really, really positive signs. And with the scrub removal from the quarry face, um, surveys previously only found a handful of plants. And when we revisited, um, there was a whole lot more plants, including um, really big clumps of Cotswold Prennycrest, like in the, in the photo at the, the bottom right. So really showing the opening uh, that quarry face up, letting the light in, um, seems to be having a really, really positive impact um, on this plant. And we even found one actually on the ground as well. So really nice to see some um, uh, positive results uh, off the back of some of our, our intervention work for our target species. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. And um, can I just remind folk to use the question and answer box to ask any questions for the Q&A at the end of this session. I'm now gonna hand over to Elizabeth Cook from Plant Life, who manages the Colours, Colour in the Margins project, um, developing um, for the Back from the Brink project. Um, she has a background in farming, research, consultancy, and natural history, tour leading so um wide-ranging sort of portfolio so i'll hand over to rebecca uh, sorry elizabeth now thank you thanks richard uh, so i'm um, i'm going to talk to you today about the color in the margins project and some of its work that we've been doing on particularly on advice uh, provision for arable pl arable plants uh, so we've done a whole load of a whole load of stuff public engagement but today, uh, today just focusing as i say on the advice so here we have uh, this picture is um i took last week a margin up in in yorkshire and it's 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 chocker block of arable plants from here it just looks like um poppies and field pennycrest but in between all of the all of the plants there's, there's so many other species going on in there and it, it nicely merges into a, a grass margin on the side and then into a hedgerow so we've got a sort of continuity of, of habitat there that lots of species like. So first up I uh, wanted to talk to you about explain what an arable, arable plant is. Uh, they're basically the weeds of a, um, a crop. So the, the common things you think about are poppy um, and then also cornflowers and corn cockle and these are species that share the same ecological niche um they 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 can grow and set seed within the space of a year and they have very different um communities in different parts of the country depending on the soil type so um on, on limestone soils you get one group of plants uh, whereas on, on clay soils you get a completely different suite of suite of species and the arable plants are many of the are plants that were in the UK that have sort of adapted or not adapted, they've, they've expanded the type of habitats they grow into. So red hemp nettle um, pictured here also grows in, in quarries and shingle, limestone scree, uh, but it also can cope with the, the cultivated disturbed ground conditions of arable farming. And some species were brought in um, by early farmers as a seed contaminant they're sort of as an accidentally with the crop seed. So arable, arable plants used to be far, far more common than, than, than they are today. Um, so I've found sort of this children's book from uh, 1910, 
which describes corn cockle and corn flour as being common everywhere. And these were just for children to go out and see and to pick a beautifully, you can just imagine a sort of a, a colorful countryside. And, and today corn cockle is pretty much extinct in the wild as a native species. It, it's sown as, as, as part of seed mixes, but it's all but disappeared as a, as a, a native species. And this has sort of been lost this, um, from the, the consciousness of the, the general public and farmers alike um, because of a, a system of what you call shifting baseline syndrome, that you remember what, what the countryside was like, um, either from your childhood or from the start of a professional career, and take that to be what um, things ought to be like and, and then look at, compare current day the status current day and to look at the declines compared to that and so we sort of forget what it it used to be like um so we've been trying to to tackle that both with uh public and with with farmers so arable plants have declined for many reasons um and just sort of touch on a, on a few of those we've got um seed cleaning so in the past um a farmer would harvest the crop they would keep back a proportion of the grain to sow next year the next year's crop and in with that they would have accidentally harvested some of the weed seeds and these would then get re-sown each year and species like corn cockle really worked well on that system because they they have a similar uh, sized seed to the grain to, to say to wheat um, and they all have very short-lived seeds that don't last for very long um, when they're in the soil. So they, they cope very well when they were sort of stored and re-sown. You take away that mechanism, which is great for the farmer, if you have a far more uh, cleaner crop, but less good um, for the weeds. Uh, but the, there are also been the well-known effects of um, herbicides and fertilizers. Um, fertilizers make the crop more competitive against the against some of the arable plants um, and then in in recent years one of the the biggest um, problems has been the switch from spring sown cereals to autumn and now uh, min till which is is really great for the soil health and for carbon however it's not so good for many arable plants that require the ground to be really turned over and and broken up and also min till is very heavily reliant on herbicides particularly glyphosate um, which obviously are not good for the arable plants uh, and this is uh, demonstrating this picture here from Rothamsted where they've for many years been managing um, this particular field the same conditions and same strips um, and you can just see the difference between the strip on the left which has not had a herbicide supplied and the strip on the right, which has for many years. And it's just a phenomenal difference. Um, so why should we why should we care? Well, um, about 70 percent of England is farmland, about 30 and about 30 percent is arable. So it's it's all over. Um, it's a vast proportion of of the UK. Um, we want healthy wildlife um, and food chains in in those in those areas and arable plants are the foundation of those food way, food webs you can sow a, a nectar and pollen mix or you can sow a, a, a bird bird seed mix but these are effectively sort of fast food for, for bees the, the nectar and pollen mixes they don't give you the full they don't give you a whole range of, of different of different plants of um, and that whereas arable plants you get a, a wide diversity of species you get they're different in different parts of the country depending on the soil type so that the the different um, the, the invertebrates that vary in different parts of the country like those particular plants um, and you just you just lose you just get a homogeneous homo homogeneity if you still just a sown seed mix um, so arable plants, they're the fastest declining 
group of plants in the UK and there is a, just a rich cultural heritage associated with them throughout farming, many connections um, with arable plants, which I don't have time to go into today, but it's something we've looked at through a different arable memory stream of the project. So by, um, by nurturing land for arable plants, um, we can provide food for, for pollinators, there's potential for integrated pest control, food source, um, all the, the seeds, the, the nectar, everything for bats, beetles, birds, and everything that's a, a, a knock-on as well as um, nesting habitat for, for birds. So although these, these declines in arable plants have only really been known about for the last 20 years, and there are options within agri-environment schemes to try and address that, they haven't had great take-up. And some of this is due to a lack of awareness within the agricultural community. They don't see arable plants as a, a wildflower, they're just a weed. So we need to try and change, we've been trying to change some of that perceptions. Um, and there's also problems of, uh, or perceived problems and I'd say some real problems dealing with problem weeds within um, arable margins. And also, there's a, there's a, we just don't know enough about where these plants occur. The arable land is very poorly surveyed um, for a mixture of reasons. Some of it's access because it's private land, and some of it's because the, uh, historically the botanical community hasn't seen it as a, haven't given as much effort to surveying arable land as they would to say meadows. And there's also general uncertainty about what agri-environment schemes going to be going forwards, which is leading to a bit of reticence among farmers to actually do things because they're just not sure what's going to be happening. So colour in the margins, what we've done to try and address um, this for some of the, the rarest species is we had 10 uh, target plants that we've been trying to really improve their conservation status. And so we have gone to 150 farms um, across the across England, which, where these target species are known from. So in, in order to choose which sites we could, because obviously there's an infinite number of, not infinite, but there, there are loads of farms you could go to, but we have to try and target and rationalise where we would go to. So we, we did a uh, data searches on the BSBI's database to look at um, the records for these species and then we've then uh, <clears throat> prioritised according to the location into certain priority areas and then by date so the more recent records are more like plants are more likely to still be present there um, and some species have a really long-lived seeds and some have short-lived so if they have long-lived seeds in the in the soil seed bank it's worth going back to sites where they haven't been seen for a while because you could do a deep plough bring up some seeds to the surface and the might populations might be returned uh, so once we'd identified the farms we wanted to go in see we were then contacting the land managers um, and we had to identify who the land managers were either the through the were um, farmers that plant life already knew or they're ones that the RSPB already knew because the projects run as a partnership between the two organizations or there are certain section of farmers that we we weren't in contact with already so we cross-referenced those with um, agri-environment schemes um, to work out um, and then we Natural England were able to supply us with some of the contact details for the um, farms that had a, a agri-environment agreement so and then we then contacted the farmers to see whether they were wanted to be involved with the project and if we were then we went out and did a surveys of the farm um, to look for the, the our target species but also the wider communities of arable plants and we then fed these survey results back to the farmers along with maps and management advice and then we then did uh, follow-ups and repeat visits in subsequent years. Um, and this is a, a model that we have found really works. Um, <clears throat> I'll just show you a, um, this is a, an example of a map that we did for one of the farms. It's a National Trust farm down in Devon. 
Um, so we're able to look per field which species are there and where they ought to be putting in measures. And off the back of this survey, the National Trust put in six metre buffer strips around across all of the farm. And then when we visited again the next year, we found that um, some of our target species were now present in bits of the farm where they weren't before because there were now more margins and and also the population and numbers had increased so uh part way towards part way through the project we did some evaluation looking at the, the farmers we've been working with uh what they thought about the advice that we've been giving them and so of the 150 farmers we work with 25 percent were part of the evaluation and half of those said that they had changed their management as a result of our in either a minor or a major way as a result of our advice provision uh, which is really great and the other half um, most of them were already doing really good things for, for arable wildlife and that our advice really strengthened their sort of their resolve to keep keep doing it and um, it felt more valued for what they were doing. So I think we were able to demonstrate that our, our methods of working were really successful. So, um, so the, the sort of advice that we've been given um, is about targeting the management of the best places to um, looking at sort of the cultivation depth and timing, keeping on top of problem weeds and methods to go about doing that because that's often one of the biggest barriers both to the farmer carrying out the management but also to the um the the, the rare plants themselves if you've got um, other more pernicious weeds then they suffer so uh but to find ways to try and keep on top of those so a um an example here of some of advice we were given that really made a a difference at a, a farm in wiltshire where the farm manager found some red hemp nettle plants at the base of a pylon. So we suggested that um, he had a neighbouring stone curlew plot um, and that that could be linked up to create a, a bigger area uh, with the area around the pylon to allow the red hemp nettle to spread out from the pylon. And then lo and behold, the following year, the population size increased from um, it, it sort of trebled from 11 to well over, to over 30. So it was really nice, um, nice to see. Other sorts of interventions and, and learning that we've we've done across our species include uh, spreading hedge parsley, which is a member of the, the carrot family. And I don't know if any of you are gardeners, but you know, know that um, they're often a real pain to get to germinate sort of carrots and parsley and parsnips. They have really short lived seeds and they need to be very shallowly sown. I certainly don't have much success growing them in my garden. So when we, we found on, on farms previously, we've been suggesting, oh, yes, plough it over, turn the soil over. Um, but then what we found that actually, in effect, that was we wasn't having great results for spreading hedge parsley. Whereas um, in till, in this case, actually for a very shallow cultivation, actually turned out to be very good for spreading hedge parsley. So that's something that we we learned learned through the project. However, this comes with some issues. Um, that um, with mintil, you've got problems with uh, weeds, particularly grass grass weeds, and um, without using herbicides, it's quite tricky to manage. So that's uh, something that we're something we've not managed to resolve that we're still still working on is quite how to balance the the management there so we did a lot of that sort of targeted management to the um uh to the, the extant populations but then because arable plants are uh, so many of our target species are so rare um broadleaf is it broad fruited corn salad is only 15 fields it's known from in the UK um, and so without some intervention there's some real potential for these species to just go extinct because uh, annual species fluctuate wildly from year to year and just with sort of stochasticity it they might just dip out um, and without the 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 
the spreading by by um, as part of the grain as the seed contaminant that used to go on, we're not generating new populations. So we've um, so this is something we looked at very carefully. As <coughs> sorry, it's something we looked at very carefully as part of the project because reintroductions are not sort of the um, the panacea of everything. You need the right management in place for these both where they still occur and at a reintroduction site. Um, so we've created some guidance here at the bottom right, um, which is can be found on the Back from the Brink website about how to go about doing a reintroduction, where to site it, because the siting of a reintroduction site is often key. Um, if there's too much of a weed, uh, pernicious weed burden or the soil's too nutrient rich, it often is not going to be successful. So that's something we've looked at. Um, when choosing our introduction sites. Okay. Um, so we've done uh, reintroductions of several different species, including uh, about 70 in total, uh, including of red hemp nettle, which we've done 16 populations of now. Uh, we worked in partnership with Q Millennium Seed Bank, who uh, supplied us with the seed. So we had them from a known source that they uh, bulked up the seed in excellent conditions where they've tried to maintain as, as much of the genetic diversity of the population as possible and and then we've then carefully chosen sites we've surveyed them before so we know what um, species are, are present there made sure there aren't any other endangered species that we might that adding something new might deleteriously affect um, we've done detailed management plans and documented it so we know what's gone where, how it was done, so we can learn from it in future. And then here we have some pictures. We worked with the uh, the RAU to do a reintroduction at their, their farm and they did it in a very precise, well-measured fashion. You can see them counting, counting seeds here. Other, other places it was not quite so um, meticulously per, per seeds, but we generally, we've always, sown per meter squared and sown a set number of seeds. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so and another species we've done reintroductions of is pheasant's eye. We've done nine new populations, again seed from the Millennium Seed Bank. And pheasant's eye has a um, has a really complex seed dormancy. So it needs to both the seeds uh, when they're shed from the plant in the in about July, they're not yet mature. They need to sort of mature. They fall onto the ground and then they need baking in the heat of heat the sun to actually mature the seed. And then next they need to break down the hard seed coat by sort of either mechanical or bacterial microbial action to to break down the seed coat. So this two stage ripening. Um, it happens happens nicely when in sort of Mediterranean regions, you can imagine it on some limestone scree, the seeds bake in the heat, whereas in um, here where we're at the very edge of its um, edge of its range, they need to um, they need sort of baking. So we trialed some artificial uh, baking of the um, the seed and that proved to be really successful. And um, and here we have um, some of our reintroduction. Uh, sites that were this year looking great. Uh, so we've produced a whole range of management and advice guides uh, that can be found on the back from the Brink website. Um, and we've done lots of other maps. Um, so I just want to thank the funders, not fun, funders, partners and members. Thank you. Thank you, Lizzie, uh, and uh, thank you everyone for uh, starting to use the Q&A. Um, please continue to use that throughout the talks and we will um, try and get through as many of those as possible at the end. I'm now going to introduce Craig Dunton from the Bat Conservation Trust, who's spent 10 years in wildlife conservation, seven years on landscape projects uh, involving bats and grassland, currently working on the grey long-eared bat in Devon and Dorset. Over to you, Craig. Uh, okay, thanks very much. Uh, hi everyone, my name's Craig Dunton. Um, I'm Grey Long-Eared Bat Project Officer for the Bat Conservation Trust, um, working on this single species project uh, since 2017, since the start of Back from the Brink. 
Um, and I'm very pleased to be here today to tell you about the work we've been doing to uh, help the grey long-eared bat. So just to um, give you a bit of background, um, I'd like to tell you just a quick bit about the grey long-eared bat. Um, it's one of, uh, uh, one of 17 breeding species we've got here um, in the UK. It's a medium-sized bat, so a wingspan of about 25 to 30 centimetres. Uh, it has these incredibly long ears, hence the name, um, which are about the same size as its body. Um, and it's one of uh, two long-eared bat species. So we've got the, the brown long-eared, which is relatively common, um, and the grey long-eared, which is very rare. So um, it's, they're known as whispering bats, the long-eared, because they echolocate very quietly and hence have these incredibly long ears um, to be able to hear their echolocation. Um, and it's very similar to the brown long-eared in many ways, um, but yeah, greyer is, is one of the key um, identi identifying features, but there's a lot of other um, sort of more minor features that are, that are quite difficult to um, tell them apart. Um, I won't go into sort of all of that right now, but if you want to email me or um, ask questions later, that'd be, that'd be fine. Um, so yeah, it weighs about 12 grams, uh, which is about the same as a two pound coin, obviously depending on the time of year um, and um, you know how, how well it's fed um, on its favorite foods. Um, noctuid moths, which are um, yellow underwings are one of the examples of noctuid moths and uh, tapulidae, which are um, crane flies, which are the adult form of leather jackets. So just a, a quick, more bit of background. Um, so bats, in including the grey long-eared, need sort of three key things in the landscape um, for their sort of habitat requirements. So obviously they need their roost sites. So in the case of the grey long-eared, they like um, for summer maternity roost, they like big open roof spaces. So the, the picture on the top left, these sort of big stone buildings with slate roofs, um, are sort of their, their favoured place for their summer roosts. Um, and then also in the winter for their roost sites, um, like many other bat species, they, they kind of um, favour sort of underground environments, so caves, mines and cellars, um, and that, that kind of environment. Um, and then also in the landscape, really important for them to be able to move through the landscape well is um, connectivity. Um, so linear features in the landscape, really important for bats to move around. And then the sort of their core foraging sites. Um, and these sort of last two are what the, the project um, that I've been working on has been focused on. So those things out in the landscape that we can talk to um, farmers and landowners about um, potentially improving. So just to give you an overview of the project area. So this species is found um, sort of dotted along the south coast um, of England. Um, but this project was focused on the sort of key areas in Devon. Um, so we've focused on roosts and um, populations um, in the South Hams, um, East Devon and the X Valley, and then East Devon. Um, and we were focused on um, land mainly in the sort of the, um, the core roost sustenance zone. So up to about five kilometres from where we knew there were core roosts. Um, and then also along the least cost path, which is the, the sort of black line, um, which is their most likely line of mobility um, sort of in moving between these populations. So there are a few key project objectives. Um, primarily it was landowner engagement, so talking to farmers and landowners about the ways they can um, manage their land in a, in a more bat friendly way. So thinking about the, the connectivity, thinking about those core foraging um, habitats um, specifically for this species. Um, so, and yeah, and, and along with that was sort of habitat creation and restoration. And uh, so for this, this species, core, the core foraging habitat is species rich grassland. Um, this was sort of based on um, radio tracking done prior to the project. Um, it was learned that this, this um, the grey long eared favours um, sort of wildflower meadows and um, unimproved grassland for its foraging. Um, and also a few other project objectives, uh, population monitoring. So um, looking at some of the, the core roosts and trying to get some of that data into the National Bat Monitoring Programme. Um, community engagement and awareness raising, trying to raise awareness of this um, amazing species in the landscape. Um, we found that a lot of people had never heard of the grey long-eared bat, so really needed to try and raise awareness um, to you know, help people um, 
to care about it. Um, and then also volunteer engagement, and that kind of links in with um, some of the population monitoring. So in terms of landowner engagement, we had a, a few sort of key ways of, um, of delivering this. Um, workshops um, that uh, farmers and landowners were invited to come along on um, to learn more about what they can do um, in terms of um, restoring species rich grassland, um, enhancing it and expanding areas. Um, delivered a lot of sort of one-to-one -one site visits. Um, so landowners and farms could get specific sort of bespoke advice on what they could do to benefit grey long-eared bats on their land. A um, whole range of presentations on sort of various subjects um, related to land management. Um, and then also farm walks, um, some sort of open to the general public, but a lot of them sort of very much geared towards um, landowners um, and farmers. And uh, yeah, a, a key part of that um, sort of the workshop and the advice was um, talking to them about um, agri environment scheme options that would be beneficial to um, to great long eared bats and um, to a whole other range of bat species and a whole range of other wildlife as well. Um, bats are a, a really good, um, uh, really good way to um, sort of uh, measure the health of a landscape. So if you're doing really good things for bats, chances are you're doing really good things for a lot of other things as well. Um, so yeah, a key key part of that was, um, you know, making sure there are lots of line linear features in the landscape, um, potentially on arable land, um, making sure hedgerow management was um, as, as beneficial as it could be. Um, but obviously a key part of um, our, our advice was um, related to grassland management. So, um, yeah, making sure that um, grassland was managed in a, in a you know, as, as beneficial way as possible. Um, I guess, you yeah, know, one of the barriers um, to this in terms of agri-environment schemes, which is the, um, the, the key options for, um, for countryside stewardship that would be of real, really, really good benefit to grey long bats were only avail available in higher tier stewardship. So there was a bit of a, a gap in, um, you know, what we could really deliver um, in terms of agri-environment schemes. Um, so, yeah, move, moving on from that, um, yeah, a key part of um, sort of moving on from landowner advice, the habitat creation and restoration side of things was to try and um, move land from the, sort of the picture in the, the top middle um, from fairly boring, generic, um, agriculturally improved land Okay, so, okay, yeah, um, yeah, to uh, more floristically um, diverse um, and structurally interesting land um, that would provide, you know, um, support for invertebrates and, and hence for the bats. Um, and that's me. So um, thank you very much. We welcome any questions um, in the Q and A session. Thanks very much. Thank you, Craig. Um, yes, and continue to populate the Q and A. Um, we're now going to have a talk from Bex Cartwright from Bumblebee Conservation Trust, who is the Shrill Cardaby Species Recovery Manager. Um, and basically, previous to that was a Conservation Officer for making a buzz for the Coast Project. Uh, so hand over to Bex. Thank you. Cardaby Project ran from 2017 to 2020. It was led by Bumblebee Conservation Trust in partnership with Bug Life and focused on the two remaining English population areas for Shore Cardaby, which are in Somerset and in the Thames Gateway. The project successfully engaged with land managers through face-to-face -face advice, providing bespoke recommendations for habitat management at 55 sites across the two population areas and in total advised on over 189 hectares of land. The Shrill Cardaby is the rarest and one of the most threatened bumblebee species in England. So it's formerly widespread across southern England, but now only five fragmented populations of the species exist. Three of these are in South Wales and two, as I mentioned, are in England. These declines can be attributed to loss of flower rich habitat and habitat fragmentation through changes in land use and management. A primary aim of this project was to enhance and connect habitats in and around the core populations of Shrill Cardaby, many of which are on protected sites. 
And key to this is habitat connectivity on agricultural land and engaging with farmers, encouraging and supporting habitat restoration and enhancement targeted at the species. Although we were looking at targeted interventions for shrill carder bee recovery, we also shared the message that the species could be a flagship for landscape scale conservation action. And interventions such as creation of legume rich margins and suitable nesting habitat in the form of tussock forming vegetation can bring much wider benefits to biodiversity and also contribute to many other environmental and sustainability initiatives such as soil protection, crop health, carbon capture and water management. The project also helped to reinforce the learning that building people's relationships with species can be just as important as delivering actions for the species themselves. So through combining advisory work with surveys, land management training days, and actually finding shrill carder bees on a site and showing them to the land managers and explaining their needs, all help to increase awareness and understanding and foster a sense of responsibility for the species, which in turn then encourages further action. I want to now briefly present a couple of case studies that demonstrate the measures put in place by farmers in the project area to encourage and support pollinators on their land, particularly aimed at Shrokada bee. It's important to say that the conservation work uh, presented here precedes the project in this case, but uh, we provided support in the form of surveys and monitoring and by offering recommendations to enhance the measures already in place. The first of these case studies is Home Farm in Somerset, managed by brothers Henry and Richard Lang. The Lang family have worked really hard to encourage wildlife on their farm while maintaining a profitable farming business. During a visit from Natural England in 2015, a shrug harder bee was found on the farm and it's continued to be recorded regularly around the farm ever since. The farm's in higher level stewardship with over 60 hectares in options for pollinators. Home farm features 16 hectares of species rich hay meadow, several of which were created from ex arable land. These areas originally received higher payments in stewardship being classed as arable reversion. However, payments were reduced following classification as species rich grassland. So to address this payment gap, the farm now brush harvests wildflower seed as a, as a crop from these areas. The whole of the, the meadow areas are cut for hay in July. Um, removal of such a key forage source in midsummer could cause shawkada bee colonies to fail through lack of um, forage at this crucial time. But to mitigate for this, a nectar and pollen strip has been sown in the adjacent field. So this continues to provide a forage source when the hay meadow is cut and late flowering in this nectar and pollen strip is encouraged through rotational early cutting. Um, also at home farm, 31 hectares of flower rich arable field margins are mown for hay in late August, but 10% of these are left uncut. And these uncut sections are left to grow to provide nesting habitat in close proximity to forage sources. This is particularly important for shawkada bee, which are known to forage at shorter distances from their nests compared with other species of bumblebee. This makes them so-called doorstep foragers. So through strategic placement of forage and nesting habitat combined with targeted management, the farm is providing a mosaic of habitats for pollinators, including shawkada bee. The second of these case studies is Lights Carey Manor, which is a National Trust property in Somerset. Since 2011, Lights Carey has been in higher level stewardship. These stewardship schemes have enabled the team at Lights Carey to increase the area of arable margins and also create species rich hay meadows. This enables them to increase the floral diversity and abundance across the site. Cutting of the arable margins is staggered to prolong the availability of forage throughout the late summer and autumn, with up to 50% of the margins cut in August and a further 25% cut in September. In order to prolong the forage season and to provide nesting habitat, a proportion of margins do not receive a cut at all and are left undisturbed until the following year. Working jointly with Bumblebee Conservation Trust and volunteers, 
The National Trust have now developed a focused action plan for Shaw Cardiby at Lights Carey. The plan will focus on further enhancing forage availability and continuity of forage, as well as providing more suitable nesting habitat close to forage sources. In order to assess the impact of habitat management interventions, volunteers on site will monitor the populations through ad hoc recording and also through the national recording scheme, BeeWalk. Collaborative working has been embedded into our work on Shaw Cardaby and will be part of the ongoing legacy of this project. In July last year, following a period of consultation and collaboration with a wide range of partners and stakeholders, a 10 year conservation strategy for Shaw Cardaby was published. This is an important and exciting legacy of this project and will inform future targeted conservation and monitoring for the species. The strategy recognises the important role that farmland will play in the recovery of Shaw Cardaby and includes objectives to embed the species into future agri-environment schemes. The conservation strategy and case studies are all available in the conference exhibition area and can also be downloaded from the Bumblebee Conservation Trust and Bug Life websites. Thank you. Thank you to Bex there. And, um... I'm quickly going to hand over to Kelly Hemmings, the Senior Lecturer in Ecology and Agroecosystems at the Royal Agricultural University. Over to you, uh, Kelly. Hi, welcome to this talk. It's slightly different to some of the previous talks. Instead of looking at uh, a management intervention, here we are looking at some education and training resources. So I'm Dr Kelly Hemmings and I'm a senior lecturer in ecology at the Royal Agricultural University and we were approached by Plant Life and RSPB under the Back from the Brink project to produce education resources on arable plants and on species rich grassland. I'd also like to credit my colleague Ian Grange and also Kath Shellswell from Plant Life. I'm going to tell you where to find these educational resources. If we have any educators amongst us, if we have those of you who deliver training, there's all sorts of inspiration here. You can either take these resources and use them as they are, or you can adapt them. So we'll talk about where to get hold of them. Then I'll take you through how did we actually go about this? And then lastly, what, what did we get out of it? What did the students get out of it? And um, what did the educators get out of it? So firstly, where to find the educational materials that we produced. Firstly, the arable plant materials. We've had some lovely talks on arable plants. I don't need to explain what those are. Um, those are located on the Back from the Brink website under the Colour in the Margins project under Downloads. <clears throat> so I've put this first because I really want to encourage uh, more people to use these. Um, these have been absolutely brilliant over the last year for me to use, for other people to use, but I'd like to encourage a lot more use of them. And they include presentations, but also lots more interactive teaching, which I'll show you a bit more about in a little while. And then the second batch of resources for species rich grassland education, again, we've had lots of brilliant presentations on this too. Um, those are also on the Back from the Brink website and they're under the Limestone Living Legacies downloads page. And again, it's a mixture of interactive teaching resources and some more lecturer led type resources. So what's it all about and what did we do? Well, we started off um, approached to develop these resources um, because we have expertise in the ecology and the agroecology side, but also, and importantly, the educational side. This was the bit that was particularly difficult to tap into um, without somebody currently working in education. So we were asked to produce these um, education materials and you would think, well, where, where do I start? So the first thing that we actually did was did some curriculum mapping. We thought whereabouts could these topics of arable plants and species rich grassland come into the curriculum? So we spent a good deal of time looking at that. We also had some workshops initially to work out how educators might use the resources, but then later actually delivering the education resources to students and getting their feedback on it as well. As, as Point4 says, it was really important to get iterative feedback and feed it back into our development of the resources. And then the upshot of all of this were these two packs that I've just shown you, um, a pack for arable plants and a pack for species rich grassland. 
So in terms of scoping out where to actually put these into the curriculum, um, you'll be aware of things, for example, like the na national curriculum for school pupils. But we were looking here more at further and higher education, um, including A level as well upwards. So for A levels and for um, level three diplomas, we looked at the exam board specifications. I've put a couple of snippets here um, to see where these topics could actually fit in, because, of course, when someone's working in education, when somebody's studying for a qualification, they have to have exactly what is relevant to that qualification. It's no use putting a topic in there if it can't possibly be covered. So we needed to find out where it could. And then for the higher education for degree level, we looked at what are called benchmark statements. Um, they're, they're similar in, in scope. They give a guidance as to what should be covered, but they're not as restrictive as those lower down the education system. So we looked at all different subjects from geography, environmental science, agriculture, conservation, countryside management, all sorts of different qualifications to see where we could actually use these. We then approached some course leaders in different colleges and universities to see whether either arable plants or species rich grassland were already covered. Um, we had some really useful responses. Quite a lot um, did cover arable plants, but in the context um, of them as being weeds rather than um, beneficial species. So that was quite interesting. We asked questions about students prior knowledge, their skills, there are quite a few questions on this, and also what kind of teaching resources would people actually use? So we had a mixture of resources um, suggested and respondents could say yes or maybe or no as to whether they would use any of these. They were quite varied. Most people said yes to pretty much um, everything, <laughs> but it was useful to see what people would particularly like. So once we would sort of figured out where we can use these, who's going to use them, how they're going to fit into the, the curriculum, we then began to develop the resources. And it was very important to us to develop these around real world sites. So they are based on real sites and, and real data. Um, the arable plants resources are in part based on the site you see on the left here, including one um, field survey activity. In fact, it's a virtual field survey activity, which has been a real blessing, um, where the, uh, students are able to compare arable plant communities in an area of spring sown wheat and an area of autumn sown wheat. The species rich grassland resources, in part, um, are based on this site local to us at the RAU here. So I think authenticity is really important when you're delivering resources to students of that age group. A few other things that we thought were really important were to cover the species themselves and their ecology before then moving on to the management side. So you have to sort of lay that ground before you can move forwards. Some of these are led by the teacher or the lecturer. Some are interactive and led by students and groups. And we had a balance of activities that could be field based or virtual or adapted in between those. And that's the, the final point on, on this here is that we wanted the resources to be adaptable. People could take a couple of slides or they could just take inspiration or somebody could take the whole lot and spend a whole week teaching it. So they're very, very, very flexible. We've delivered lots and lots of workshops. Um, I think we've been in contact with probably over 300 students between the two projects and probably and counting, to be honest. Um, a variety of different degree courses have used the resources and given feedback, including some of our own at the top of that list there and some of our partner institutions um, lower down the list there, as well as other groups. For example, the School Farms Network actually had um, a day with us as well. And recently we've been delivering um, sessions online. Each one is very slightly different, so I can vouch for their being adaptable um, to the particular group that, uh, that you're, you're teaching. Things we have produced include um, presentations, and now of course teaching is not all about presentations, but there is a, a baseline of knowledge because we found quite a few people hadn't covered this before, and quite a few educators rated their students as not having any prior knowledge before. So there's a bit of information to get across. So there's that kind of more traditional material. Everything we've done is research informed and fully referenced. Um, so it's not just uh, pulled out of thin air, because again, if you're teaching students of a certain age, you need to be able to justify where you've got your information from and obviously encourage um, good academic practice. Don't worry, this isn't a quiz for you. Um, there is a quiz as part of the pack. Um, 
again, it can generate a bit of discussion. It's a bit of fun. Um, some people know more than than I would have guessed, actually. So that's really, really encouraging. I've used this kind of thing on open days and to engage with the public. Um, and that's that's quite entertaining and people are really, really into it. So that was nice. We've got um, instruction sheets, both for the lecturers and for um, students in terms of practical field activities. So what do you need to do, different steps, um, any data that they, they need, any um, sheets they need to fill in, and also how these can be adapted to different parts of the country. Because as we heard earlier, um, for example, arable plant communities do vary by soil type and in different parts of the, of the country as well. So again, adaptable and field practical, obviously essential to get students involved in this sort of topic. This is a, a screenshot of me making one of our little video clips. It's a series of, of pictures that flip up and it's a virtual field survey broken down into quadrats. So I, I did literally go to a site with a, with a square meter and photographed each species present within and uh, put them into this, this video document. Students can then press play, pause, record the species using ID guides and um, so on until they've got um, 12 quadrats, I think, on this particular one. That can be used then, for example, for national vegetation classification. Um, it could be used for all sorts of other things besides, for example, um, just teaching species ID. It could also be used for looking at things like community analyses if you want to teach some statistics as well. There's a lot that you can actually do with this. It's designed to be a bit inventive. So in terms of bringing students up to the higher levels and differentiating it for, for the top, um, there are comparative data sets, for example, for the arable plants with spring wheat and the um, autumn sown wheat. Um, students could do a small research project on that. If they were to go through both the virtual surveys, they could compare species richness, they could compare community composition. It could actually be quite involved. Um, so I think that's good to target that end as well. Could be used for assessments. You could set a report, for example, and students would be told to get their data from those two videos, just as if they were in the field and um, produce a report on the results. And that, that has been a real blessing, um, partly because the academic year is, is never great for teaching um, plant species identification, um, and partly because this year it's been especially difficult. So um, I definitely don't want to replace um, field work with virtual, but some really good opportunities to use these virtual resources when the, the real world does not permit. We've got um, again scenarios based on real sites. Um, this is a, a grassland site um, near near to us, and it comes with uh, some data on pH and a bracken encroachment. And the student's task is to decide what to do, what agri environment schemes you might choose. Similarly, this one is is based on um, one of the RAU farms, and again, there's information about the different fields. Um, where your arable plant communities are. And again, their task is to think about what management they might put in place. So get them into groups and they work on this and um, they've produced some really nice work actually. What's the lecturer need to do? Well, that's all covered as well. So we've got instructions for the lecturer on the, the sequence of the session and also a suggested lesson plan or session plan or whatever you'd like to, to call it. Um, a three part plan. It's got an introductory activity, a main and then some student follow up where they get a bit more involved with it, as well as adaptations as to how you could use the resources, but less of them if you haven't got time to use everything or how you could really max it out into something um, really quite detailed if you'd like to do that as well. What did, what did we learn from all of, all of this? Well, um, we got student feedback on um, both the arable plant and the species rich grassland resources. Um, we started off by asking them if they'd come across the topics before, which was really interesting. Um, I'm yet to do any analysis on this, but um, I, I will. Um, the arable plants, most students either put don't know um, or uh, like the second one here, they thought they were um, the crops. Uh, very few had, had heard of arable plants in the context that, that we talk about them, but very few. So it was a new topic for them completely. Um, for the species rich grassland, um, students did have a bit more um, prior idea, but they associated it more with um, a, a bag of seeds, for example. So we had to um, explain the naturally regenerated community versus um, simply sowing a mix. And then, of course, the, the other area of um, restoration as well. So that was quite useful and students got to feedback on what they thought of the session 
um, they were all really positive about, about the sessions. They often came up with some really good ideas. Um, for example, for species rich grassland, I had a question saying, how, how would you teach this in February? And students were quite thoughtful about this. They put um, answers such as you could use um, herbarium specimens or they put dried plants, I think. But the idea was they'd, they'd actually thought about this and how you could get, get around some of the restrictions around the field season and how it falls into the academic year. Because as any educator listening now knows, as soon as you get to the, the ecology season, um, exams hit, you know, it's, it's May, it's June. Um, so you're trying to teach this stuff throughout the rest of the year. So it was good that students were attuned to that. Um, this is what um, a group of agriculture students did using the um, farm scenario. I was really pleased with their work. They had, uh, frankly, an epic discussion about what they would do with this farm. They went completely into it. They'd costed it. Um, they'd got all the agri-environment uh, systems completely sussed as to which they would put, put where. Um, so again, it does show you can really run with some of these and go into quite a lot of detail. Um, and they thanked me very much for the session, said they'd like some more of this of this sort of thing. So I was, I was really pleased with that and they, they were a great group. So pleased to see that. Um, even more so because I've, I've enjoyed um, working on these so much and I've used them so much and they've been so useful, um, given the way the last year has gone, Actually, I've ended up making more resources on different habitats, not to do with this project, but just for my own use. So again, this is another way you could use the resources to inspire some of your own resource creation. So this is a, a coastal NVC where I've done exactly the same thing, but for, but for coasts when I was able to be out um, and uh, then bring this back for students to, to use. So um, I think this has been a huge bonus. I think going forward next year, I think we'll we'll be using these sorts of things a lot again, um, as well as um, more more in the way of field field practical as well. Stemming from all of this, we've had students really run with an interest. Um, so not just on the particular education resources that um, I've listed there briefly, but uh, this particular student was interested in our arable plant, um, the red hemp nettle reintroduction, which we heard about earlier. And um, she did her dissertation on it and actually won a prize um, with the uh, Cotswold Naturalist Field Club, um, which was really super. And we're really, really proud of her, her work. So someone's actually been able to really run with, with some of these topics as a result um, of working along with these. And then um, further ahead still, I'm looking at master's level. I have a master's by research student um, who is looking at species rich grassland versus um, the pollen and nectar mixes, again, which was actually flagged up as a point earlier. Um, and she's working on comparing the nectar values of those two amongst um, other, other research questions. So it's another area where working together on these particular projects has benefited the students enormously. There are millions more examples that I could give you, but uh, those are uh, some of the some of the really best ones. So I want to say thank you very much indeed for listening, and um, also to thank the partners and funders. Thank you very much, Kelly. Uh, it would be very interesting to get your feedback on the resources we've got on the Farm Wildlife website. Okay, we're going to move over to uh, Q&A now and we have all of the uh, panel members available to answer your questions. Um, it's not too late to ask questions if you want to pop them in the Q&A, uh, but I've, I'll try and get through at least one question for each of the speakers uh, and we are obviously slightly overrunning, uh, definitely aim to finish for 12.45. Um, so starting with Jennifer, uh, did you have any objections to using electric fencing on the sites and how did you deal with these? Actually, we I don't think there were um, any particular objections. Um, I say uh, my colleague was um, very much involved with that, but as far as I know, there weren't, um, we were potentially worried that there might be, um, you know, it is a heavily used site. Uh, a lot of people go there to walk their dogs, uh, to take family out, um, but, uh, I, I haven't been aware of any any complaints or any problems that came from putting up the electric fencing. Um, fortunately, uh, the paddocks were on the slopes and the majority of people um, sort of stay uh, walk on, on the plateau, which I suppose helped uh, in some way. Um, they also weren't completely closed off. There were spring spring loaded gates uh, in the electric fencing so people could still walk uh, along the slopes if they wanted to walk in with the cattle. 
Um, and we also had um, clear signage on each of the, um, the compartments as we put them up to explain what they were there for and, and why the cattle were being um, um, penned in in certain areas. So I think all of that probably helped us, um, you know, uh, avoid any sort of negative uh, um, consequences of putting up the, the fencing. Great, thank you. Uh, a question for Elizabeth. How often would you deep plough for arable plants and are there any alternatives for farmers who are moving away from ploughing to help soil management and, and carbon storage? Uh, not, they, don't know, they don't need it every year, um, but this is one of the problems we've come across moving to Mint Till is often farmers don't, don't have the kit anymore um, to be able to do a deep plough because um, they just all got mint, mint till kit. Um, it varies from the species, so we're saying spreading hedge parsley can cope with just a, a mint till, whereas some of the others really prefer a, a plough, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a really deep plough each year. And yes, there is a conflict with the soil carbon, um, but I don't think they're mutually exclusive in that you just need more of everything, um, more margins. Okay, thank you. Um, and Craig, um, how big a gap is um, considered to be a barrier to bats in the connectivity of habitats in the landscape? Hmm, that's a really good question. Um, it probably varies on the species quite a lot. Um, from the radio tracking studies that were done prior to the project, um, it was deemed that um, individuals from maternity colonies would go up to about five kilometers from their roosts um, to forage um, but essentially if there was good habitat closer than that um, then they wouldn't bother to go any further um, so a, a lot of you know around around some of the roosts where there's you know much better quality habitat um, it was sort of up to about two kilometers and then the, the individuals wouldn't bother to go any further um, and I get yeah talking about other species um, Greater Horseshoe would be sort of four kilometres from a maternity colony, so it would be um, varying for the different bat species. Um, but essentially, you know, we, we want as much um, and as larger areas of, of um, unimproved species rich grassland within the landscape so they can, um, you know, be more mobile. Um, because, yeah, essentially, when, when you get to certain points, there will be gaps um, that will restrict their movement. I'm not, you know, I'm not sure exactly what those. Um, distances will be, um, but it will, yeah, it will, it will probably vary. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not actually seeing any questions for Bex or Kelly on the Q and A yet. So please, uh, any questions that you do have, uh, post them up. We can still come back and answer them after the event um, in written form. So, um, so if you have any questions, please do. I just go back to uh, Jennifer. There's another question in about. What are the lost processes that the mechanical scraping for juniper replaces? Uh, and is this repeated mechanical scraping the long term solution for for the project? Um, well, really, um, there used to be a lot more grazing, a lot more extensive grazing, which would have kept the grasslands a lot more open. Um, there would have been a lot more uh, open bare patches that the, the would have been available for the juniper to disperse, um, be dispersed by birds and, and to drop and, and germinate. Um, so by doing scrapes, you're sort of um, mimicking that open bare ground in a sort of localised way and, and getting a, a response quite, quite quickly. Also, you know, there would have been more um, of the rabbit grazing and perhaps more um, local quarrying as well, which would have opened up, uh, opened up uh, bare soil for juniper. Um, really, I think rather than um, continued um, scrapes, we'd probably be looking to encourage more um, of the grazing, more, um, more of the restoration grazing and to keep that, that going rather than having to do the, the localised scrapes, um, just so we sort of get back to that, um, the, the grass and in the condition, that more open condition, that the, the, more, the, the more areas opened up by the action of the hooves. Um, to actually create those those opportunities for juniper um, uh, germination, um, but yeah, this, the scrapes are just a really great way of just getting um, a result uh, very quickly uh, and actually allowing the plant to to um, spread um, in that local area. 
friend. Uh, and Elizabeth, again, um, are, are farmers nervous of people finding rare species on, on their farm? And, and how, how do you address those kind of issues? Yeah, some, some of them are. Um, others aren't. Others are very keen to share what they've got. But um, I think the approach we're taking is just a great degree of sensitivity. It's working out what the farmer's happy with um because we're happy to just share the data with them and not with certainly not publicizing it where they don't want us to publicize it um and although we we sort of got a obligations to to share some of the data onto the the nbn we can do it at a scale where you can't sort of a 10 kilometer square where you it doesn't have to be a precise location um and sadly the I think there's a perception that, oh, if I've got a rare species, I won't be able to do something, but I, I wish it was the case. Um, a lot of uh, plants and fungi aren't as protected as we'd like them to be. And particularly with we've got these archaeophytes um, and neophytes, the, the arable plants that have been brought in by uh, humans, they don't have the same degree of protect um, status as some of the more native species. Um, yeah. 